to chase after white, I, a little princess with a monthly allowance of hundreds of thousands, have pretended to be broke for three years. All for the sake of mooching off his meals and drinks. But now, his ex-love has suddenly returned and even mocked me for being a poor loser. Fine. Fine. So, you think having more money is better? I won't pretend anymore. Chapter 1 I pursued White for a full three years before finally winning him over. Everyone said I was too persistent and that's why he agreed to be with me. I believe he must have discovered my shining qualities. I am so intelligent, charming, and beautiful. How could White ever get tired of me? So, I asked White why he liked me. He looked hesitant and struggled to find an answer, finally saying, your poverty but unwavering determination has inspired me. At that moment, I was dumbfounded. Others might think he was lying. But looking at White's expression, I knew it was true. He never tells lies to deceive me. This complicates things. It turns out that in White's eyes, I have always been a resilient and cheerful poor girl. It's all my fault. These past three years, I relied on him for meals, pretended to be poor, and went too far with it. I saw in WeChat that my dad transferred 100000 as my living expenses. Dad, my daughter, your mom said starting from today, your restrictions are lifted, and your allowance is restored. If this had happened before, I would have taken that money and partied for three days and nights with everyone. But now, I dare not. I quietly requested a refund and swiftly deleted the WeChat transfer record. When White saw me silent, he sighed and softly said, finish these two pages of questions, and I'll take you to eat spicy hot pot. After my third year, White spent all his time in the library, and he forced me to prepare for postgraduate exams with him. But me? I fish for three days and sunbathe for two. Whenever I open a book, I feel sleepy. White is utterly speechless about me. I looked at him and said softly, I don't want to eat hot pot, I want to eat you. White's fair ears gradually turned red, and he tightly squeezed my hand. He has a cold and stern appearance, like a hard-to-reach flower on a high peak. But when you get close, you'll find that his ears easily turn red. White, you see, appears cold on the outside. But inside, he's even colder, and it's not easy to warm him up. Reflecting on these three years of pursuing him, who wouldn't sigh and say, if only I had this kind of motivation for studying back then, I would have been accepted into any top university. Everyone thought I pursued White out of superficial reasons, but in reality, I had planned it all along. Because White was a financially supported student by my dad, his name was intertwined with my entire high school life. Chapter 2 In the third year of junior high, I was as fat as a little piglet, with pimples all over my face during puberty. My mom, in order to make me lose weight, made up her mind to restrict my eating. I sneaked into my dad's office and secretly nibbled on a chicken leg, just at the time when White came. He was a year older than me and already in his first year of high school. He was wearing a white t-shirt and faded jeans. When White walked in, his whole body exuded a sense of melancholy, almost freezing the surrounding air. I knew who he was. My dad had been sponsoring him for three years. When he was eight years old, his mother fell seriously ill, which devastated their family. He was featured in the local newspaper from a young age, with articles saying that he accompanied his mother in the hospital, cooked and did the laundry for her. His father was a gambler who would beat him every day until the neighbors complained to the community committee, and only then did his father calm down a bit. Later, his mother passed away, and his father disappeared. Only his grandmother was left, and my dad knew her, so that's why he sponsored him to continue his education. Every year, he would send his grades to my dad. Every time he was mentioned, my dad would say how excellent he was, while also suppressing me a little. But I'm not afraid of hot water even if I'm a dead pig, so I didn't care. But when I saw him in person, I couldn't help but fall. Handsome. His grandmother was sick, and he came to borrow money from my dad. Knowing this news, that night I brought fruits to the hospital, ready to launch my attack. But when I arrived at the hospital, I saw a girl in a light yellow dress throwing herself into White's arms and crying. It's okay, it's okay. 
I already borrowed the money, and Grandma will be fine, White said, supporting her shoulders and helping her stand up, his expression full of tenderness. Don't cry. You came so late, Uncle and Auntie must be worried. Since I'm getting discharged as well, let's go home together. White stood in the dim light, lowering his head to wipe the girl's tears. I tightly held the fruit in my hand, looked at my chubby fingers, and ultimately couldn't take that step forward. Since then, I've been like a thief, peeping into White's life. Watching him win first place in the English speech competition, watching him achieve top grades in his class. And watching him ride a bike with Snow, watching him and Snow stand together on the stage, watching him carry Snow's backpack. I hired one tutor after another, crazily studying and no longer going out to play. I desperately tried to lose weight, hiding in my room, crying while nibbling on lettuce leaves, refusing to eat meat no matter what my dad said. It took me a full three years to finally approach White. And it took me another three years to turn White into my boyfriend. Chapter 3 White is one year ahead of me. When I entered school, he was already the most famous handsome guy in the whole school. There were so many girls chasing after him, using all sorts of methods. In the three years of high school, I worked hard to study and lose weight. But when I finally got close to him, I didn't feel as brave anymore. The moment I had a chance to interact with White was when I asked the auntie in the cafeteria for an extra portion of food. My mom is a tough person. In order to force me to study abroad, she cut off my source of income. When I first entered university, I spent money recklessly and within a week, I was so broke that I couldn't even afford meat. When I was getting my food, I didn't notice that White was right behind me. After I sweet-talked the auntie and got an extra portion of braised pork and vegetable soup, I turned around and White was standing behind me. My face turned red instantly, and I almost bumped into him. White quickly reached out to support me and asked for my WeChat. At that time, I thought White must have fallen in love with me at first sight. But after adding each other on WeChat, he sent me some part-time job information, like working at a milk tea shop or convenience store. I looked at them in a daze. Since then, I started working behind White, following him around. It was during that time that I learned how difficult White's life was. Every day, he either went to class or worked, without any leisure activities. As soon as he received his paycheck, he would only keep a small amount for his living expenses and immediately use the rest to pay off debts. He owed my dad, he owed others. He kept track of every bill and even paid the interest. As I continued to hang around White, I accidentally became his girlfriend. Looking back now, it still feels a bit surreal, like winning the jackpot. I was lost in my thoughts when Pearl suddenly shouted in the video, startling me. Get him. Pearl said mischievously, I've prepared all the equipment for you, Golden Leo. You have to unleash your leopard charm, make him infatuated and unable to resist. Pearl is my best friend. We grew up together and know everything about each other. I hid under the covers and called her, clutching my lace nightgown, and nervously said, but what if White doesn't fall for this? We've been dating for six months, but White has always been reserved with me. I thought, on White's birthday, I'll make a big move. Sometimes I can sense his reaction, but he quickly composes himself, acting like nothing happened. Sigh, I even start to doubt my own charm. Well, then he's not a real man. You're not the little chubby girl from back then. Now you're the goddess of desire, sitting firmly on the throne of the art department, Pearl continues to encourage me. You must win over White to make up for the six years you've invested. You make it sound like these six years were all about sleeping with White, I emphasize. We have true love. True love, you know? Pearl bursts into laughter. It's all the same. True love means enjoying each other over and over again. We discuss and plan our actions, simulating them in my mind. Then she asks me, Golden Leo, when do you plan on telling White about your true identity? Her question catches me off guard, and I fall into silence. If she hadn't brought it up, I might have forgotten about it. In front of White, I go by the name Goldie, a broke student who splits a penny in half, licks the yogurt lid, and licks the plate clean after eating braised pork. When I entered university, I insisted that my dad change my name. 
And so, he changed it from cash to Goldie. When I received my ID card, it felt like it had changed, yet also remained the same. The love for money runs deep in our family. Forget it, forget it. With White's personality, if he finds out you've been deceiving him for three years, he'll be so furious that he might just spit blood on the spot, Pearl answers before I can say anything. Do you even need to ask? You better keep my identity hidden. If White finds out, we're all doomed. I grit my teeth and decide not to dwell on this issue for now. White calls me on video, and I quickly end Pearl's video call. It's almost 11 p.m., and you're still not asleep? White furrows his brows in the video. I finally notice the time and mutter softly, I miss you so much that I can't sleep. Last month, I stayed up so late that my period didn't come. My roommate even suspected that I was pregnant. I was at a loss for words. White took me to the hospital for a checkup, and the doctor said it was due to staying up late. Oh, the look on White's face. He probably thought I accidentally got pregnant, only to find out that the child wasn't his. After returning from the hospital, he checks on me regularly and punctually every day. White paused for a moment upon hearing my words and softly said, All right, go to sleep now. Kiss me, I coquettishly pleaded with him, looking at his damp hair, my heart racing. Ah, uh. how can he be so handsome? And he's still my boyfriend. White quickly glanced around, pecked at the screen, and his ears turned red as he urged me, Go to sleep, I'll wake you up at 7 tomorrow. I hung up the call and happily lay in bed, savoring the moment endlessly. My roommate Elisa rushed into the dormitory, her eyes shining brightly as she pulled me up. Bow. Um. Where did you buy this Hermes bag? Today, I completely stole the spotlight and left that arrogant guy in shock. This replica is just too convincing. Elisa recently met a rich second-generation guy during a gathering. That guy may have a lot of money, but his arrogance knows no bounds. Today, Elisa said she wanted to show off and brought my fake Hermes bag along. I really wanted to tell her that it's real. But I dare not say it. I'm afraid she'll tear me apart. After all, in these three years, my roommates have taken care of me a lot and never forget to bring me a portion of whatever they eat. I really didn't plan to end up like this. Who knew that things would backfire? My mom, in a fit of anger, cut off my allowance for three years. I followed White around, working odd jobs, and everyone thought I was as poor as a church mouse. Forget it. I urged her, hurry up and get ready. The lights will be turned off in 10 minutes. Only then did she stop asking me more questions. I secretly wiped away a sweat, always feeling that if I were to reveal the truth one day, they would beat me to a pulp. Finally, it's White's birthday. I'm gearing up and making a grand declaration in our WeChat group. Me, if I can win over White in one fell swoop, Pearl is willing to gain 10 pounds. Polished gem. Get lost. Chapter 4. This is the first time I am celebrating White's birthday. For the past three years, I was too busy working and couldn't celebrate with him. But now, I have the opportunity to celebrate with him. When White called me, I lied and told him that I had plans in the evening and couldn't have dinner with him. Well, alright then, White calmly replied, his tone devoid of any emotions. I deliberately asked, what's wrong? Is today a special day? Normally, you just eat a few bites. White has no desire for material possessions. As long as I don't accompany him for meals, he can make do with a simple meal of vegetables and steamed buns. During the three years we worked together, he would rotate between two sets of clothes in the summer and two sets in the winter. But I couldn't stand it and bought him new clothes with my salary. However, to my surprise, he turned around and bought me a necklace worth over 1,000. It broke my heart. With 1,000, we could have eaten so much beef, but instead, he bought a necklace. White remained silent for two seconds before saying, No, then let's meet tomorrow. I hung up the phone, smirked, and realized that I was already at his house. White has a small two-bedroom apartment that was left to him by his grandmother. He comes back every weekend to clean it. I lit scented candles in his bedroom, filling the room with a subtle fragrance. 
I rolled on his bed, thinking about things I shouldn't be thinking about, my face turning red. White usually studies at the library until 7 p.m. on Saturdays and definitely comes back by 8 p.m. He is very punctual. I took a shower and changed into clean clothes, but it was already half past seven when I lay down on the bed and fell asleep. When I woke up, I realized it was already past 8 p.m. Damn. I messed up at a critical moment. I quickly tidied up my clothes and heard some movement outside. White must have already come back, luckily he hadn't entered the bedroom yet, otherwise, I would have waited for a whole night in vain. I took a deep breath, adjusted my shoulder strap. White. Happy birthday. I opened the door abruptly and jumped out. But what I saw in front of me left me petrified. Snow was standing next to White, wearing a light yellow dress. After three years, she had become even more beautiful, like an elegant swan. In that moment, it felt like time had suddenly reversed back to six years ago. The once dark and chubby me was hiding at the door, watching the two of them. Snow looked at my attire and her eyes revealed a hint of disdain. I instinctively covered my chest, feeling embarrassed and utterly humiliated. Chapter 5 That night, White wrapped me in a blanket and introduced our identities to Snow. Snow smiled and said, So you're his girlfriend, I thought it was something else. She stopped halfway through her sentence, appearing somewhat awkward. I knew she wanted to say that I was not a serious woman. If someone else had said that, I would have immediately gotten angry. But as Snow looked at me with a hint of apology in her eyes, I couldn't stay mad. Well, she was my goddess throughout high school, after all. Snow, next time you come to my house, let me know in advance, White held my hand and bid farewell to Snow, calmly saying. After all, we're not kids anymore, and some things are inconvenient. I saw a slight stiffness in Snow's smile, but she quickly said. My sister-in-law is so lucky. When we were kids, I used to intercept so many love letters for my brother. Now that he has a girlfriend, I, as his sister, am useless. Snow is a few months younger than White, and she has called him brother since childhood. In the past, when I couldn't continue my weight loss journey, I would follow behind them, munching on cucumbers, and using White's face as my motivation. At that time, hearing Snow call him brother so affectionately was both romantic and intimate. I was so envious that I even went home and asked my dad to find me a brother. The result was a beating. Listening to it now as adults, it feels a bit strange. It's not like we're in a blue spring ride manga, constantly calling each other brother. It feels uncomfortable. I want to ask White how he feels about Snow returning to the country, but I can't bring myself to ask. After all, I witnessed White sitting in the pouring rain on the day Snow went abroad to study, looking lonely and desolate. And at that time, I was sitting across from him, nibbling on lettuce leaves, watching him. I told Pearl about Snow's return to the country and shared my little thoughts. Pearl rolled her eyes and scolded me. Come on. What are you feeling inferior about? Snow is a moonlight goddess. You, Golden Leo, are no less. If you break up with White now, I guarantee that half the male students at South University will be celebrating. Well, you don't understand, I said, biting into my ice cream assassin, feeling melancholic. From 9th grade to 11th grade, I always followed behind them for no reason. I even shipped them together in my heart. Snow was the moonlight goddess in my heart. Beautiful and smart. At that time, I thought to myself, there's no chance between White and me. If they can be together in college, it would fulfill the dream of this shipper fan. Pearl was browsing through web pages and suddenly exclaimed, Golden Leo. Quickly check the campus forum. I opened it and saw that the first page was filled with information about Snow. Sensational. International rising star artist Snow joins South University. Gossip. Snow and computer science heartthrob White were childhood friends. I clicked on one of the posts and read about their childhood stories. Things like White playing basketball while Snow brought him water, or Snow dancing while White sang. The person who leaked the information was clearly from their school and everything they said was true, with many photos attached. Anonymous, I testify. They are really sweet. 
From junior high to high school, same school, same class, childhood friends, it's especially enviable. I remember one time when Snow vomited in class, White didn't even attend his classes and rushed over to the hospital with her in his arms. I couldn't help but reply, clearly, it was because Snow was in extreme pain during her period, not because she vomited. I have the right to speak about this matter because I was at the hospital that day and witnessed White and Snow going to the hospital together. As I continued reading the posts and comments, I felt a sense of reminiscing about our youth. No wonder everyone loves shipping couples, it's addictive. However, as I kept reading, the tone of the comments started to change. Damn it. What the hell are these idiots talking about? Pearl exclaimed angrily in the video, and I also saw those comments. Anonymous, art major Goldie has no shame. Taking advantage of the situation and becoming the third wheel in their relationship. If she hadn't thrown herself at White for three years, getting naked and climbing into White's bed, causing a misunderstanding between White and Snow, would she even have a chance? Anonymous, is this for real? I think Goldie looks like a seductress, flaunting her big breasts and dressing provocatively all the time. She was born to seduce men. How could Snow, that pure girl, be her match? Now that Snow is back, this homewrecker Goldie should step aside. With his talent and her beauty, what does he need her for? Anonymous, classmates, don't think I'm spreading rumors. I'll post a picture to show you how vain this woman is. She worked part-time throughout her three years in college, and now she suddenly has money to wear designer brands. I'm sure she's being financially supported by someone. She's cunning, mixing real and fake, making it hard for people to find out. I clicked on that picture, it was taken sneakily in the dark, and I couldn't see it clearly unless I zoomed in. I was getting interested in those comments when the door was forcefully kicked open. My roommates who went to take elective classes stormed in. Elisa, who was at the front, rolled up her sleeves and said with a fierce look. Fuck. Let's all get online and fight back. Big accounts, small accounts, all of them. When I was a water army, these people were still hiding under their blankets biting their toes. Roommate 3, contact your programmer boyfriend and have him check the IP. Roommate 2, ask your law major boyfriend how to deal with these rumor spreaders. A tiger doesn't show its might until it's pushed to the limit. Don't mess with our roommate 4, or I'll make them suffer to death. Chapter 6 When White burst into the room, I was sitting next to Elisa with tears in my eyes, watching her passionately argue with the haters. When he saw me crying, his face grew colder. He came over and hugged me tightly, ruffling my hair as he said, Goldie, don't be sad. I will find those people spreading rumors about you and make them face the consequences. I blinked, confused by his anger. A few insults don't bother me. I have nothing to be sad about. She just put in eye drops, Elisa interjected, continuing to type on the keyboard. All right, these people have some skills. They seem to be professional trolls. There was a momentary freeze in White's expression. He raised his hand and wiped away the tears on my face, not saying anything more. We initially thought it was just a few trolls hiding behind the internet, targeting me. But when we actually traced those IP addresses, we were stunned. They were foreign IPs, making it difficult to hold them accountable. The school blocked those accounts, but the rumors about me continued to escalate. Every few days, someone would post something, and the school would delete the posts and ban the users. Being a sugar baby is so cool, just cover your mouth and silence the discussion, and the problem disappears? My reputation at school fluctuated between being blacklisted and popular. People on the street would point and whisper about me. She's Goldie, right? She's pretty good-looking. No doubt, otherwise who would sponsor her? Did you see the watch on her wrist? Worth 300,000. Sigh, just lie down there and spread your legs, and you'll earn 300,000. Easy money. Those whispers behind my back reached my ears without any reservations. There were even people who harassed me with phone calls and text messages, asking me, Goldie, how much for a night with you? If it's too expensive, can a few of us chip in? I initially thought that these rumors and gossip only affected my personal life, but I never expected it to involve White as well. 
White got into a fight for me with a guy named Dennis, who was a well-known rich second-generation student in the computer science department. Dennis practically wanted to engrave the words, I'm rich on his forehead. He had pursued me before, but I had rejected him. When Snow found me, her eyes were red and swollen from crying. She said, Goldie, you know how much effort my brother put into that project. If he wins the award, he can secure his graduate studies and even receive a substantial prize to repay his debts. But because of you, he got into a fight with Dennis. Dennis's uncle is one of the judges on the committee. And their family sponsored this competition. If they withdraw their support, many people will hate my brother. Shouldn't Dennis be the one getting beaten up? Elisa exclaimed angrily. White did a good job. I say that bastard deserved it. White fought Dennis because of the text message asking how much I charge for a night, which was sent by Dennis. Goldie, I understand that you're feeling wronged. But the priority now is to calm down Dennis, Snow pleaded, pulling me aside. Dennis said that if you apologize to him, he will forgive my brother. Goldie, don't you like luxury brands? After this is over, I'll give you two designer handbags, LV and Chanel, how about that? Sis. Why does your way of speaking sound so strange? Elisa furrowed her brow and muttered. And why do you have to talk about this in the cafeteria? Now those haters will gather on the school forum tomorrow. When Snow approached me, Elisa and I were having lunch in the cafeteria. A crowd watched as she walked in, crying and begging me to apologize to Dennis. Everyone was eavesdropping on our conversation, and their gazes towards me grew increasingly strange. I turned to look at Snow, who was in tears over White's situation. And here I was, the legitimate girlfriend, displaying a calm expression. So, I should apologize to Dennis? I stood up abruptly, a mocking smile on my face. All right then, let's go. Chapter 7 White and Dennis were still in the small classroom when I approached, and I could hear Dennis shouting. I sent the text message, so what? Dennis yelled, I've slept with her. White, your woman is nothing special. White clenched his fists, but his three roommates held him back tightly. Calm down, boss. Calm down. If you resort to violence again, you'll be written up. Dennis smirked triumphantly and said. White, if you dare lay a finger on me, I guarantee you won't graduate. Wasn't your graduation project sent to participate in the University League? My family sponsored that project, and I'm telling you today. You're finished. You won't pass the entrance exam, and after graduation, every company will blacklist you. White and his dormmates' graduation project was participating in the University League, and if they could place in the top three, they would secure recommendations for further studies and receive a university student entrepreneurship fund. White had put in a lot of effort for this project, but now, because of Dennis' words, all their hard work was about to go to waste. It's because there are too many idiots like Dennis that people like White, who are dedicated to their projects, end up being busy for nothing. Dennis, go ahead and report me to the school. White grabbed Dennis by the collar, pressed him against the wall, and said coldly. Let's see if the school punishes scum like you or punishes me. Whether I can graduate or pass the entrance exam is not up to you. It's my entrance exam results that will speak for themselves. I pushed open the door and walked in, and White immediately approached me. Goldie, White whispered, holding onto my shoulder. I've already withdrawn from the competition and planned to sell the project to a company. I found out that someone overseas is paying trolls to attack you. Once I receive the money from selling the project, I'll hire someone to investigate this matter. Don't worry, I will uncover the mastermind behind this and clear your name, leaving those people with nothing to say. Upon hearing this, my heart ached. That project meant as much to White as his own child. He had been developing it since his freshman year, and it took over three years to see results. He always wanted to use this project after graduation to recruit partners. Once he sold it to someone else, he would lose all autonomy. White wasn't just selling a project, he was selling his dreams. White, you don't need to sell the project. You don't need to withdraw from the competition either. Didn't you say that after graduation, you wanted to start your own business? 
Earn money and buy me designer brands, let me live in a big house? I hugged White tightly and pushed him out, then locked the door behind me. Elisa banged on the door and shouted, Brother Four. Don't bow your head to scum like him. Through the window, White looked at me with a heavy gaze, as if he had just weathered a storm. Snow stood beside him, also looking at me, her eyes still red and swollen from crying. Everyone was watching me. Dennis approached, reaching out his hand to touch me. So, have you made up your mind? Goldie, if you kiss me in front of everyone today, I'll spare White. You know, my family started out in the software industry. With just a word from me, White can forget about surviving in this field. I smiled at him and then raised my fist, delivering a powerful punch right to his face. Damn it. If I don't make this scum cry like a baby today, I'll cash in my chips and be reborn. All those years of training in mixed martial arts that my dad forced me to do for three years just to lose weight, I'm putting it all to use today. I remember the words my dad told me back then. Daughter, your mom and I have been working hard all these years to support you. Out there, we don't start trouble, but we're not afraid of it either. Just keep forging ahead. If something happens, we've got your back. Chapter 8 Dennis screamed in agony, his face bruised and swollen. He rushed over, opened the door, and shouted, Goldie. I'm going to make sure you go to jail. Snow was in a panic, crying continuously, trying to stop me. She said, Goldie. Why are you so impulsive? You're not thinking about my brother at all. Even if the project is lost, I can still invest money for him to continue development. But if you don't apologize to Dennis, he and the school will take action, and my brother will face disciplinary measures. Who is White's real girlfriend? Goldie is too reckless. She doesn't care about White's well-being because she has a sugar daddy backing her. Poor White, having such a girlfriend. I. I wanted to explain, but I didn't know how to say it. I started to feel anxious. White, you'll be fine, don't worry. White grabbed my hand, looked at it, and asked, does your hand hurt? I was taken aback by his question. White massaged my hand and said to Snow. Snow, Goldie is my girlfriend, and we share any consequences together. She has been slandered by rumors and harassed by someone like Dennis, and I am willing to stand up for her. Our affairs are none of your concern. Brother. Goldie has really fooled you. Snow shouted in disbelief. Just think about it. She's a poor student, where does she get the money to buy designer brands? She lied to you saying they were fake, but I can tell that everything she's wearing from head to toe is real. I'm only looking out for you. I glanced nervously at White, afraid that he might misunderstand. Snow, furious, stared at me and said, if you truly love my brother, then break up with him. Being with you will only subject him to scrutiny and what good future can he have? I blinked and looked at Snow, a bit dumbfounded, and instinctively asked her. So, if not with me, are you suggesting he should be with you? Does being with me mean having no future? Being with you means he can skip struggling for 10 years? Snow, I initially wanted to give you some face, White took out his phone and showed Snow some evidence, saying coldly. But by bullying Goldie like this, you've completely lost any sense of shame. We have evidence that you hired internet trolls to spread rumors and defame Goldie. I've already reported it to the police, so get ready to be summoned. Everyone heard this news loud and clear, and it was like stirring up a hornet's nest. I looked at the interface of White's phone, which showed a WeChat conversation with someone named Polish Gem. Pearl. When did she get in touch with White? White. Goldie. Let me tell you, I've already called my dad. When he arrives, you'll have to answer to him, Dennis said triumphantly. By then, begging me won't do you any good. I couldn't help but sigh at his words. Ah. Uh. Someone actually wants to rely on their father's power against me? Dennis saw me sigh and became even more smug. Scared, aren't you? If you dump white and sleep with me for a year, then I'll let you off the hook. Chapter 9 Snow bought water armies to attack me abroad, and Pearl found out clearly. 
Pearl was afraid that I would endure silently for White's future, so she decided to send the information to White. Fortunately, she disguised herself as a good citizen who does good deeds without seeking recognition, so my identity wasn't exposed. Snow knew that we had discovered her, so she stopped pretending. We all sat together in the stairwell classroom, laying all our cards on the table. Goldie, it was me who posted online, trying to force you to break up with my brother, Snow confidently said. If it weren't for me studying abroad, what relevance would you have? White opened a bottle of water and handed it to me, looking at Snow and said, if you hadn't gone abroad, you wouldn't have mattered either. Snow looked at White in disbelief. Brother. You've always liked me. Why don't you admit it? During these three years of my study abroad, you would call me every day, worried that I wouldn't adapt. When we were kids, you would take me to school and pick me up every day. In middle school and high school, we were always together. Hearing this, my ears perked up. Yes, I also thought that White and Snow were a perfect match. When Snow left, White was so heartbroken. If it weren't for me clinging to him all these years, patiently waiting for Snow, wouldn't they have reunited? White turned his head and suddenly flicked my ear hard. Rubbing my ear, I looked at him with some grievances. Why, after shipping them for so many years, can't I have a happy ending? Snow, when my mom was hospitalized, my grandmother fell ill, and my aunt helped me a lot. If it wasn't for her cooking and delivering meals to me every day, I would have starved. White explained clearly. When you were harassed by bullies from another school in junior high, my aunt was particularly worried, so she asked me to accompany you to and from school every day. After you went abroad, because you couldn't adapt to the foreign environment, you would cry a lot. My aunt asked me to call you whenever I had time. Over the years, I treated you like a little sister. White paused for a moment and continued. Moreover, the year you went abroad, you confessed to me, and I rejected you. I made it clear. From childhood to now, I have never liked you. I don't believe it. Snow looked like she was about to collapse. But. But in school, I brought you water, performed with you in shows, and you never rejected me. White remained silent for a while and said helplessly. You used to go around telling people that I liked you. You have a sensitive personality, and if I rejected the water you brought me in front of so many people, they would gossip about you. I listened to this with a stunned expression. The ships I've shipped turned out to be fake. The water delivery and dance performances were all fake. Aren't you proud of yourself? Making me look like a clown. Snow, tears streaming down her face, shouted. Either you've been kept by someone, or you're just a vain woman wearing fake designer brands. Someone like you is not worthy of being with my brother. I pursed my lips and stole a glance at White, still trying to figure out how to tell him about my situation. Just then, our doormates rushed in. Something's not right. Dennis, that scumbag, came with his father and Jim to cause trouble for you. Elisa said, panting, what should we do? The second roommate also panicked, I heard that Dennis's father came prepared this time, intending to donate one million for educational equipment to the school and forcing them to take action against you. Well, this is not good. The third roommate scratched her head. Although Dennis harassed Goldie first, if Goldie retaliated, it wouldn't look good for us. In fact. I weakly spoke up, I'm not afraid of Dennis. My dad is a millionaire. At what point are you still pretending? Several roommates rolled their eyes at me. Me. Chapter 10. Dennis brought his father to trap us in the classroom, coming in with great momentum, looking like he wanted to kill me. His father, Duke, runs a medium-sized software company that specializes in providing smart settlement systems to malls across the country. Our supervisor, Jim, was also there with us. Jim is a two-faced person, always eager to help students with power and influence, just like a dog. But when it comes to students without money or influence, he puts on a stern face and uses his limited power to the extreme. Jim particularly dislikes me because of the incident where I was framed, and he specifically called me for a conversation. He said I didn't behave like a proper student, engaging in improper relationships and disrupting campus order. 
I know he holds a grudge against me because of what happened with Elisa. Every year, Elisa applies for the National Inspirational Scholarship, and she is one of the top students in our department, almost guaranteed to receive it. In addition to that, my father, along with several companies, set up a scholarship at our university specifically to help financially disadvantaged students. Studying art is already expensive, and Elisa comes from a poor family, so I asked my father to reserve an additional spot for Elisa every year. Who would have thought that Jim would secretly replace the scholarship spot? He gave it to a male student from the management department. The problem is, that student is by no means financially disadvantaged. Elisa took us to confront Jim, and he actually said that we art students have no social value, which infuriated Elisa. I immediately reported the issue to my father, and since then, Jim has never been responsible for scholarship arrangements. Jim started holding a grudge against us in the dormitory and often made things difficult for us. Now, with Dennis' incident, Jim finally got the opportunity he was waiting for, and he was reveling in it. Jim looked at me sideways and said, President Duke, this is the student who hit Dennis, her name is Goldie. Today, make this girl apologize to my son. The school must expel her. Duke's face was trembling with anger. Look at what she did to my son. If she's not expelled, our family will never let this go. I couldn't help but say, if you let it go, you'll be dead. If the whole family lets it go, that's the end of the lineage. You can eat anything, but you can't say anything. The heavens are watching. What if he takes it seriously? What will you do then? Look at her. Look at her. This is what a good student from South University looks like. Duke wanted to slap me right then and there. Dennis angrily said, how dare this ordinary student be so arrogant. She must have a powerful backer. Supervisor, we must investigate this thoroughly. We can't let her tarnish our school's reputation. Why not investigate my own father? I'm sure that will surprise you, I said with a smile. Jim, with an angry face, said, Goldie. Do you still have the demeanor of a student? Beating up a fellow student in public, showing no remorse, and provoking trouble. Do you know how many people are complaining about you at the school right now? Duke, with a righteous tone, said, Supervisor. You said her information can't be found in the academic system. Doesn't that prove that she's not a formal student at South University? She's just using the name, and this matter is quite serious. Jim smiled at Duke and said, President Duke, rest assured, South University will never let any violating student go unpunished. The school has already decided to give Goldie a disciplinary record. As for her information, I have already reported this matter to the school. If she's just using the name to enter the school, it will be dealt with seriously. Supervisor, this is so unfair. Elisa exclaimed anxiously. It was clearly Dennis who was at fault first, he harassed Goldie. Jim slammed the table and angrily said, Do you have the right to speak here? Goldie's behavior is improper, disrupting the campus atmosphere. If you dare to argue further, you will all receive disciplinary records. I didn't know that students who voiced their concerns would be given disciplinary records, I said. Jim, surprised, said, Vice President, why are you here? This is a small matter that I can handle. The vice principal was accompanied by a group of four people. Duke saw the approaching person and immediately ran up to greet him, extending his hand warmly and saying, Chairman Million. How coincidental to see you here. My father, without even looking at Duke, walked straight towards me, grabbed my ear, and scolded. Always causing trouble. Being bullied like this outside and not even calling me. So, others have fathers, but you don't? If it wasn't for Pearl telling me, I wouldn't have known that my daughter was being insulted at school. Those words. They're so hard to hear. Your mother has been crying at home, regretting pushing you too hard over these past three years. My father spoke, his eyes becoming slightly red. Heartless. Allowing others to bully you. Initially, I didn't feel wronged, but when my father said that, I suddenly burst into tears. All right, all right. My father hugged me tightly, also crying, good girl, dad is here, dad is here. 
The incident involving Million shocked everyone, their eyes wide open. Duke, on the side, kept wiping his sweat. His small company was nothing compared to my father. My father always maintained a low profile, but everyone knew he was the wealthiest person in the city. The amount of money he donates annually is enough to compensate for Duke's company's profits. Southern University has two new teaching buildings, all thanks to my father's donations. President Million, rest assured, we will handle this seriously, the vice principal said confidently. Since its establishment, South University has upheld high moral standards and will not tolerate any dubious activities. We are already investigating those individuals who spread rumors and defamed Goldie on the school network. None of them will be spared. President Million, it's a misunderstanding, all just a misunderstanding, Duke slapped Dennis across the face and shouted, apologize to President Million's daughter. You wretched scoundrel. Duke, stop with this, my father said firmly. Let's handle things properly. This is our company's lawyer, and we will follow legal procedures for everything. As for this counselor, my father said indifferently. If you couldn't find Goldie's personal information, it's because she changed her name. She had a close call with a kidnapping when she was young, so I have always made sure that her information is kept hidden throughout her schooling. The vice principal is aware of this. Jim listened in shock, stuttering out an apology. As for Snow, she seemed dumbfounded. With a malicious intent, she pointed at me and cursed, all this drama. You're just a fraud. A rich girl pretending to be someone else and dating white. Are you playing games? You never had genuine feelings. When it came to that matter, I felt guilty. I glanced to the side, and White calmly watched everything unfold. Well, he was gripping my hand tightly, exerting quite a bit of force. As for my roommate. Hmm. The expression in Knife's eyes couldn't hide anything. Chapter 11 Dennis was expelled, and those classmates who spread rumors and slandered me under false identities were given serious disciplinary actions. As for Snow. The reason she returned to her home country was actually due to plagiarism while studying abroad. However, her family managed to suppress the incident, but now the person whose work was plagiarized is planning to sue Snow. Once the news broke, Snow's reputation plummeted, and South University immediately took action against her. And as for my dad. He shamelessly showcased my wealth. Under my name, my dad established a foundation at South University called the Goldie Entrepreneurship Fund. Any South University student with a project that passes the evaluation will receive financial support from the Million Group. After giving it some thought, my dad also donated a batch of air conditioners to the school, with each unit engraved with the word Goldie. South University's weather is unbearable in the summer, even ants walking on the ground can be scorched. With this batch of air conditioners, my classmates practically wanted to erect a monument for me. My dad also formed a legal team specifically to serve all the female students at South University. From now on, if they encounter issues such as sexual harassment, defamation, or damage to their reputation, they can rely on our family's legal team to fight for justice on their behalf. After everything was settled, I finally had to face a storm-like trial. I sat on a chair in the middle of the dormitory, surrounded by my roommates conducting a trial. Elisa, the leader, took out the Hermes bag she had previously carried and her hands were trembling. So, this Hermes bag is real? It costs over a hundred thousand to order one, right? I nodded silently. The second roommate, pointed at the watch she had worn with tears in her eyes. And this Jaeger LeCoulter watch you let me wear, it's also genuine? The one that sells for 230000 on the official website? I coughed and continued nodding. The third roommate, carefully smoothed the wrinkles on the dress she was wearing. So? This dress you let me borrow for a date, it's a genuine Chanel piece, or a custom-made runway design? I didn't dare to make eye contact with them and kept nodding. Goldie. You're finished. Completely finished. Elisa yelled, announcing my verdict. After all this time. Our dormitory was hiding the daughter of a billionaire. The second roommate looked dizzy. I guiltily said, I really didn't mean to deceive you. These past three years, 
My mom cut off my source of income, and I've been living quite miserably. My mom has an extremely stubborn personality and can be quite ruthless towards me. This matter can't just be let go, deceiving us for three years. Elisa declared decisively. Here's the deal. A fancy dinner that costs 200 bucks per person. Treat us to a meal. No problem, no problem. I immediately nodded, let's eat to our heart's content. This is almost it, second roommate patted my head and exclaimed. It's terrifying to think about it. We had millions worth of belongings in our dorm, and we never locked the door when we went out. Third roommate held my hand and said with pity. Fourth roommate, we're all okay, a big meal can solve it. You should think about white. It's been a week since your dad left, and he hasn't come to call you for self-study. Sigh, that's true. If I were white, I wouldn't even know how to interact with you in the future, Elisa sympathetically said. He, the infamous poor campus heartthrob at our school. And you, the hidden wealthy heiress. People can suffer together, but they can't share happiness. Goldie, I'm starting to think that my sexual orientation can also change. How about considering me? After all, we know each other inside out and have shared a bed. Second roommate and third roommate also clamored to dump their boyfriends, all eager to enjoy a free ride from me. I knew they were trying to lighten the mood and make me laugh. I sighed, not knowing how to face White anymore, considering I deceived him from the beginning. My phone's notification sound rang, and it was a message from White. I gave you a week off. When you're rested, come to the library to find me, White messaged me. No need to buy bubble tea when you come. I bought you lemon green tea. I brought your backrest, pillow, backpack, phone charger, and iPad. After a few seconds, White sent another message, Cash, as long as you come, I'll be waiting here. Ah. Uh. I screamed, comrades. We'll have our big meal tomorrow. I'm going to self-study. God knows. I've never been so eager to go self-study before. Chapter 12 Cash's Confession My name is Cash, also known as Goldie. My nickname is Goldingit, given by my grandfather. And my best friend Pearl gave me the nickname Golden Leo. My father is the famous millionaire million in this city, and my mother is the talented lawyer Penny. In theory, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but as a rich second generation, my life has been somewhat miserable. From the age of three to eight, for five years, I was subjected to ongoing abuse by my nanny. During those years, my father was too busy to come home, and my mother was focused on her career. The only one who accompanied me was the nanny. I guess because I was so lacking in love and security, I truly considered the nanny as a family member. I really liked the nanny, you know. She always smelled nice, and when she cuddled with me to sleep, she would gently call me Ingot. Ingot, do you like Auntie? Does Auntie always take good care of you? Ingot, you must listen to Auntie, or else Auntie will leave. Then you won't have Mom and Dad with you, and you won't have Auntie either. You'll be very lonely. Ingot, does Auntie look good in your mom's clothes? Ingot, some kids wanted to play with you, but Auntie refused for you. Let's play at home with Auntie. During my time in kindergarten, I had no friends and no social interactions. When I misbehaved, Auntie would lock me in a small compartment under the stairs, with just a little bit of light coming through the ventilation fan. Sometimes she would keep me there for five minutes, sometimes for ten. Auntie would occasionally say a few words to me, her voice helping to drive away the darkness and making me even more dependent on her. By the time my parents discovered that something was wrong with me, I was already eight years old and was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, commonly known as autism. On that day, my mother held me and cried all night long. I know she feels sorry for me, but I don't blame her either. Not every woman has the natural talent to be a mother. She valued her career and neglected my growth. She didn't want to see me get sick. As for my dad, he was furious. In the following years, he started losing his hair and became a Mediterranean man. My grandparents came from our hometown and gave my dad a good beating. You always say Ingot is too introverted. Doesn't speak enough. It will get better as she grows up, 
my grandfather exclaimed, hitting my dad's back with his cane. I don't think you deserve to be her parents. What's the point of making so much money? Your daughter has been bullied like this, and you didn't even know. I couldn't handle the stress. Whenever I heard loud shouting from outside, I would immediately hide in the staircase. Locked inside, I closed my eyes tightly. I could hear my mom crying and calling out to me, and my dad's anxious footsteps. Ingot, grandma is here to pick you up, my grandmother opened the door, carrying me out. She kissed my forehead, how about going back to our hometown with grandma? We'll make your favorite jelly there. Grandma has a little yellow dog, and you like dogs, don't you? And back home, there are many fruit trees. When they bear fruits, your grandpa will take you to climb the trees and pick the fruits. How about that? And so, my grandparents took me back to our hometown. The hometown was very different. During hot summer days, I sat under the grapevines with my grandpa, munching on watermelon. It was refreshing. He wore a big straw hat, and I wore a small one as we went to the river to catch fish and shrimp. In winter, when it snowed heavily, my grandpa and I built snowmen and rolled snowballs. My grandma would cook warm soup and bring it to my bed for me to drink. In the first year back, I hardly spoke. But my grandpa wasn't worried. He would always talk to me, even if he didn't get a response. Ingot, look, this fish has a bulging belly. It has little fish inside. We need to release it so that the river will always have a constant supply of fish. Ingot, these are locust flowers. Smell them, aren't they fragrant? When I was a kid, I loved eating locust flower dumplings. Let's gather a basketful and let your grandma steam them for us. When we climb the tree, don't tell your grandma that I let you climb, or else she'll scold me again. Ingot, come, let's write big characters together. Calm your mind. Hey, grandma, come and see. Ingot drew a shrimp. Maybe our little treasure will become a great artist in the future. In the second year back, I started to communicate with my grandparents. I want to eat jelly, I looked at my busy grandma in the kitchen and tugged at her apron. Jelly, it's been a while since I made it, Ingot, you. My grandma trailed off and turned to look at me, tears shimmering in her eyes. She hugged me tightly, okay, okay, jelly it is. Grandma will make jelly for our ingot. I was drawing, and my grandpa came over to comment, this horse is well drawn, ingot. Keep up the good work. Grandpa, this is a little dog, I didn't even lift my head, just kept drawing. My grandpa paused for a moment, then burst into laughter. Later, I saw my grandfather hugging my grandmother and crying together. Old man, Ingot has started talking. Yes, she can speak now. Our Ingot will be fine. In the third year back, I started learning to communicate with peers. My grandmother gave me a little backpack and pushed me out the door. Go on, go on, I packed some fruits and snacks for you. Come back when you're tired from playing. I was able to take this step because my grandmother always invited children to our house to play. Those few kids, after two years, even though we never spoke, I became familiar with their faces. They took me to the mountains to pick mulberries and apples. On the way, we encountered wild rabbits and chased after them. Only after I returned did I realize that my grandfather was worried and secretly followed me all the way. As a result, he twisted his ankle while climbing the mountain and had to call someone to carry him back. And so, I spent five years with my grandparents in my hometown. When it was time for me to start junior high school, they were afraid of delaying my education, so they had my parents bring me back. During those five years in the countryside, my grandparents raised me healthy and strong. But. I actually became a little chubby. There was no sun protection in the countryside, my grandmother's cooking was delicious, and I was going through puberty. A 12 or 13 year old girl, indulging in eating and playing, ended up becoming a little chubby. The way my mother looked at me, it seemed as if she thought I had been switched at birth, and she almost wanted to do a paternity test. She hired a nutritionist for me, took me to various spas, and vowed to transform me into a little beauty. My father, seeing me able to communicate normally, although a bit absent minded at times, couldn't stop smiling. In junior high school, I met Pearl. 
She was beautiful and proud, holding my hand as we walked on the playground, shining a light on me too. One of the major reasons for our deep friendship was because I was so clueless. Pearl said, I've never seen someone so clueless, so curious. As a result, Pearl didn't expect that I was not only clueless but also a bit silly. Some people mocked me for being chubby and dark-skinned, and I cursed them as big idiots. They insulted me as a country girl, and I insulted them as big idiots. They called me an ugly duckling, and I called them big idiots. After ten rounds, I had him running away in frustration. Big idiot, he knew nothing about the power of repetition. When he grows up and sees the advertisements in the elevator, he'll know how terrifying it is. From then on, whoever sees him has to say, Ah, uh. he's that big idiot. <laughs> That's the big idiot Dan, who secretly admires Pearl and envies me for always being with Pearl. Let's not talk about this big idiot for now. I find it hard to be interested in things outside, often just daydreaming and drawing. It wasn't until my third year of junior high that I met White in my father's office. That was the first time I actively showed interest in someone, and my father was so excited that he almost brought White to me as a brother. Of course, it didn't work out, and my mother scolded me. If other people were blurry shapes in my eyes, then White was someone with edges, angles, and colors. Looking back, I think the reason I could see White clearly at that time was probably because he indeed had a good appearance. At the age of 13, everyone around me was just starting to go through puberty, with acne still present, nothing much to look at. White was one year older than me, tall and upright, with a cool and clear demeanor that made everyone take a second glance. Moreover, he had a stunning beauty named Snow by his side. My dad didn't expect me to get into a good school. My mom just wanted to send me abroad in the future, as long as my grades were passable. When I reached my third year of high school, my mom wanted to send me abroad, but I resisted and went to South University instead. My mom was so angry that she threatened to cut off my allowance, but my dad thought she was overreacting. You don't understand. My mom secretly wiped away her tears. Million, have you ever thought about it? When we get old, if we let go of this big conglomerate, how will Ingot survive? She doesn't even know what she can buy with a hundred yuan, and she gets scammed and has to pay up. All she does is draw and daydream. If I don't push her to go abroad and experience it, she'll just stay cooped up in her little shell forever. When will she ever grow up? Autism is not something that can be completely cured. Although I have learned to communicate with others and pretend to be fine, I still appear a little foolish when I daydream, and I become stiff and clumsy in crowded places. Pearl taught me a trick, Golden Leo, when you want to communicate with others, just pretend to be enthusiastic. Once you get familiar with them, they won't care if you're a fool or not. When you don't want to deal with someone, raise your chin and act aloof, and they'll back off. I have to admit, Pearl's trick was very effective. After I entered university, I quickly integrated into the dormitory by pretending to be enthusiastic. By the time they realized I was a fool, it was already too late. The bond was already there, and there was no turning back. Thanks to my mom's influence, I had become quite attractive by the time I entered university. Many guys pursued me, and it annoyed me. So, I often acted aloof and looked down on them, causing fewer and fewer people to chase after me, until finally, it stopped completely. That being said, during my three years of high school, my biggest interest was shipping couples. So, two or three days a week, I would go and observe white and snow. Sometimes, I would follow them while munching on a cucumber, sometimes an apple, and sometimes drinking coconut water. Pearl thought I had become obsessed with shipping couples. I even created a separate account and joined the forum of White School, becoming a fan of their couple. <coughs> Our fan group name was Snow White, sounds romantic, right? As for my username, <laughs> I called myself White's Armpit Hair. I was the biggest fan of the support group, providing various supplies and cheering for our Snow White. When White played basketball, I bought banners. When Snow danced, I bought flowers. When White and Snow's exam results came out, I treated all the fans to bubble tea. Of course, even though I didn't show my face, other fans would hold up banners. This event is sponsored by White's Armpit Hair. 
I chuckled as I rode up to this point. I thought you were looking at some adult manga, White reached over and took my notebook, glancing at the words on it and raising an eyebrow. White's armpit hair. Do you know that during our three years of high school, whenever I wore short sleeves, both boys and girls would stare at my armpits? Even substitute teachers were curious about what my armpit hair looked like. Mind your own business about girly stuff. I snatched the notebook back. I'm actually planning to serialize a new manga, brainstorming ideas. Aren't you supposed to be working overtime? Hurry up and leave. White ignored me, picked up the remote control, and adjusted the air conditioning temperature. I protested, why did you set it so low? It's going to be cold. He threw the remote control aside, took off the watch on his wrist, and stared at me, saying, to prevent you from complaining about being hot later, I lowered it in advance. Seeing the look in his eyes, I scrambled to escape from the study. Pinching my waist, White placed me on the desk and kissed me. Hmm, this is already the second year after White and I graduated. I became a manga artist, but it was too cold when I serialized my manga. My dad was afraid I would be sad, so he generously rewarded me with a million yuan, which actually made me quite popular. Now, fans urge me to update every day. The fans sincerely say to me, Big sis, you're so rich. Drawing manga must be for your dreams. We will protect your dream. Feeling guilty, I think to myself, everyone should subscribe to me more. After all, as White said, I'm responsible for the household expenses and not allowed to use my dad's money. Water and electricity bills, oh. Air conditioning and bathing in the summer are expensive. So, I'm always forced to compromise and shower with White. As for White, he's pursuing a master's degree while working on a project at a large company. I asked him why he didn't start his own business, and he said it wasn't the right time yet. My dad secretly told me that White is not an ordinary person. He has enough strength and will soar to great heights. My dad also said, but don't worry. Our family is the reins that control the dragon, and we won't be let down by him in the future. Many people are curious about how White would treat me once he found out I'm the daughter of a billionaire. Well, it's just the same as before, he would still buy me gifts. When he has money, he'll buy something more expensive, and when he doesn't, he'll buy something cheaper. In the end, whatever he gives me will make me happy. For example, we would secretly go to the riverside at 2 in the morning and release fairy wands. Or he would drive me to the mountains to watch the sunrise. When he has money, he would take me out for a lavish meal, importing wagyu beef. When he doesn't have money, we would eat spicy skewers on the roadside, and he would add a pack of instant noodles. Of course, by the time the results of my postgraduate entrance exam in my senior year came out, White had completely given up on the idea of furthering my education. I haven't written about what happens next. Because life goes on, and I don't know what tomorrow will bring. Chapter 13 White's Secret My name is White, nothing special about that name. My dad is a gambler, and when he drinks, he beats my mom. Sometimes, he even hits me. I grew up in the eyes of sympathetic people, in a family like this, without any friends. When I was eight, my mom got sick. My dad was afraid of medical expenses, so he ran away. My grandma borrowed money from everyone she could, but my mom pulled out her oxygen tube and passed away. Then, not even two years later, the police station came knocking on our door. They said they received news from another city that my dad got drunk and fell into the river, drowning. They asked if our family wanted to claim the body. I didn't go, and I didn't tell my grandma about it either. I felt numb to pain in life, but I knew I had to act mature so that my grandma could rest assured. In my first year of high school, my grandma, who was my only support, fell seriously ill. After much thought, I went to seek help from the local billionaire, Million. He had a connection with my grandma and had been sponsoring my education all these years. I borrowed 300,000 yuan from him, but it couldn't save my grandma's life. She passed away with tears in her eyes. She was afraid of me being alone and helpless in this world, with only her tightly clenched hand. After my grandma's passing, I often sat alone in the empty living room. When morning came, I would take a cold shower and go to school. 
The neighbor auntie was a kind person. She often cooked for me and asked me to take care of her daughter, Snow. Grateful for her kindness, I agreed to take care of Snow. Snow is a very sensitive girl, and sometimes I find it quite annoying, but I don't show it. When my grandma was alive, she often said, a drop of water will repay a gushing spring. I felt the need to repay the kindness of the neighbor auntie. Life is just so dull, day after day. One day, I discovered the chubby little black girl following me, and suddenly life seemed more meaningful. She often appeared not too far from me, sometimes nibbling on a cucumber, sometimes holding an apple. When she finished eating whatever she had in her hands, I would already be at school, and she would be gone. I didn't know when I developed this habit, but I always observed what she was eating. Her way of eating was quite interesting. She would take a big bite, stuff her mouth full, and then chew slowly, like a little hamster. Sometimes I wondered why she was following me and what kind of person she was. After all, it was strange for a girl like her, chubby and around middle school age, not focusing on her studies but following me. One or two days were normal. After I entered high school and started to look better, there were often little girls following me. But if it lasted for months, it was abnormal, and it made me constantly look behind me when I went out. I noticed a pattern, whenever I was with Snow, the chubby little black girl would follow me for a longer time. If it was just me, she would look at me for a while and then leave. I couldn't help but guess, could it be that she had a crush on Snow? When I was in my second year of high school, there was an organization in our school called Snow White, claiming to be the support club for Snow and me. The president was called White's Armpit Hair, sponsoring activities for the girls in our school, which gave me a headache. In my second year, there was a basketball game, and I participated. The first prize was 500 yuan. During the finals, White's Armpit Hair bought a lot of things and brought them over, and they even sponsored our team uniforms. No matter how much I asked, I couldn't find out who White's Armpit Hair really was. During halftime, I saw the chubby little black girl. It had been a year since we met. In this year, I watched her become fairer, taller, and much thinner. She was very, very quiet, sitting in a corner, taking out a box of fruit salad from her backpack to eat. When the chubby little black girl didn't speak, she seemed a bit absent-minded. I saw a male student from our school deliberately bump into her, obviously trying to strike up a conversation and get her phone number. In this year, the chubby little black girl had changed a lot. Her eyes were big, her face was round, and she was fair, like a little steamed bun. I thought to myself, in the future, there would surely be more and more people pursuing her, and she might not come to see me anymore. When I felt lost, the chubby little black girl just glanced at that male student and silently stood up, moving to another corner. I watched, and for some reason, my mood instantly improved. Snow came over to give me water, and I felt inexplicably nervous. I looked up and happened to meet the eyes of the chubby little black girl from a distance. Her eyes were shining as she looked at me, and I got a little distracted. By the time I snapped out of it, Snow had already handed me the water. The chubby little black girl finished her box of salad and, just like before, disappeared. In the second half of the game, I played a bit absent-mindedly, but managed to gather my spirits and win the match. As the first place winner, White's Armpit Hair, the fan club behind the scenes, arranged for an ice cream truck to come to the school. The setup was quite grand, which made me feel a bit awkward, and I couldn't help but wonder who this White's Armpit Hair really was. In my final year of high school, I finally found out that White's Armpit Hair was none other than the chubby little black girl. It was quite a coincidence that on the day Snow fainted during class, I took her to the hospital. While Snow was getting checked, I stood outside and immediately spotted the chubby little black girl. She was wearing a white dress and had a diamond necklace around her neck, looking even fairer than before. As soon as she appeared, many people in the hospital lobby were looking at her. The chubby little black girl's eyes were still bright, with a soft and tender appearance. She didn't see me and found a place to sit down. Almost unconsciously, I sat down behind her and saw her using WeChat. Her WeChat name was White's Armpit Hair, and in that instant, many images flashed through my mind. So, she followed me for two years just because she shipped me in snow. I was dumbfounded, my heart aching. Suddenly, the chubby little black girl turned her head and looked at me. 
This was the first time in two years that we were so close. My throat felt tied up, and I couldn't utter a word, only able to stare at her. The chubby little black girl looked at me for three seconds and then casually stood up and walked away. As she started walking, she even stumbled a bit, standing still for a moment before continuing on. Later, I asked her what she was doing at the hospital that day. She earnestly told me, I get nervous and scared when there are too many people around, so I push myself to overcome it. I go to places like hospitals, plazas, and school entrances from time to time. Upon hearing that, I hugged her for a while. After the college entrance exams, Snow was going abroad to study. Her father had earned a lot of money in these past few years. Snow confessed her feelings to me, saying she liked me. If I stayed with her, she would stay. I rejected her, speaking frankly that if it weren't for my aunt's plea, I wouldn't have gotten close to her at all. Snow cried as she entered the airport, and I felt a sense of relief. On my way back home, it started raining heavily. I sat under the umbrella of a convenience store, hiding from the rain, feeling quite sad inside. I pondered if Snow was gone, if the support club disbanded, would the chubby little black girl still come to see me? I looked up and saw her. She was wearing a yellow Pikachu hat, sitting under a large umbrella across from me, eating a vegetable sandwich. Without much thought, I walked towards her. But I couldn't reach little black chubby. A black Mercedes parked between the two of us, and when the car disappeared, little black chubby was gone too. I stood there for a while, walked over to take a look, and found a Pikachu headband on the table, probably dropped by little black chubby. I picked it up and waited for a while, but little black chubby didn't come back to find it. I wore that headband on my hand, hoping that little black chubby would see it someday. After I entered college, little black chubby rarely appeared. Perhaps the school was far from her home, or maybe when Snow left, she didn't want to come see me anymore. I wore that headband, and my roommate teased me. That's when I found out that this small headband was worth 3,000 yuan, a collaboration with a luxury brand. Little Black Chubby was wealthier than I had imagined. But she lost it and didn't turn back to find it. Maybe in her eyes, I was just like this headband, only a trivial part of her life. Whether it existed or not, it was insignificant. When I was in my sophomore year, I never dreamed that little black chubby would come to study at South University. When I saw her in the cafeteria, I doubted if I was dreaming. Did you see her? She's a first-year art student named Goldie, my roommate nudged me. Anyone who wants her WeChat can line up along the Yangtze River, but she's not easy to pursue, especially cold. She was already very beautiful, with her hair tied up high in a ponytail, wearing a beautiful goose yellow dress, like an innocent princess. Standing in the crowd, she shone brightly, dispelling all impurities. I tightly held onto my tray, pretending to be calm, queuing behind her. When it was her turn, she pitifully said, Auntie, please, give me a little bit of meat. I have no money. I wished I could buy all the cafeteria's meat for her. Let her eat for a lifetime. When she swiped her meal card, I glanced at the balance, and there were only five yuan left. I almost exhausted all the courage I had in my life and asked her for her WeChat. I didn't expect that she actually added me. To hide my nervousness and embarrassment, I restrained my expression and coldly shared some part-time job information with her, trying to find something to talk about. I didn't know what happened to her, but she actually started working with me. Those two years, when I look back, it feels surreal. I can't believe we spent almost every day together. She was very diligent and never felt tired. Goldie was not sensitive to money at all. When she received her salary, she would spend it all in two or three days. Later, when she got money, I would help her plan how to spend it. By the time I was in my junior year, I started doing projects to earn money and gradually stopped doing those part-time jobs. Goldie also stopped going as frequently. I guess her family gave her money again. I often saw her secretly putting imported snacks into my backpack. She had more and more new dresses and jewelry. Hey, boss, my roommates crowded around and asked me, what's the progress between you and Goldie? You two are always together, but we never see you holding hands. Are you really dating? Many people were curious about this question. Goldie rejected many people, 
but that didn't mean she accepted me. I didn't dare to confess to her. I was afraid that if she rejected me, she would start avoiding me. Goldie's birthday was coming up, and I was thinking of preparing a birthday gift to test her feelings. Coincidentally, that night, I went to deliver something for a project and met her at a well-known club in the city. That night, Goldie was dressed particularly beautifully, wearing a diamond crown on her head and being embraced by a tall girl. I watched them enter a private room, with Goldie surrounded by a radiant glow in the dark. After a while, her friend held her hand and they came out. I instinctively hid in the corner. Her friend said, Golden Leo, come on. You've been with White for three years in high school and two years in college, and you still haven't won him over. Darling, life is a game, and dreams are just fleeting. Enjoy life while you can. If you don't make a move soon, you'll be wasting your precious youth. Life is a game, a fleeting dream. Goldie only saw me as a game. The next day, Goldie invited me to go to an amusement park. When we were on the Ferris wheel, she tentatively touched my hand, just like her friend taught her. I wondered, if I avoided her, would Goldie never want to play this game again? I held her hand back, gripping it tightly. Goldie was surprised at first, but then she seemed particularly happy. When the Ferris wheel reached its highest point, I held her and kissed her. She was a bit dizzy and leaned on my shoulder, asking me, White, do you like me too? In my heart, I said, No, I love you very much. After that day, we established our romantic relationship and walked hand in hand on campus. Even though we were together, I still felt a sense of emptiness inside me. To be honest, I didn't know how to hold on to Goldie firmly. She had little material desires. She would be happy when she received gifts, but she wouldn't be sad if she didn't receive any. Even when others pursued me, she didn't get jealous. She would listen to their stories and then turn her head to read comics. Snow's appearance caught me off guard. She did something that hurt Goldie, which made me even angrier. But Millian stepped in and resolved the situation, protecting Goldie like an umbrella. In my anger, I also felt powerless. I couldn't give Goldie much. Goldie didn't know that I had known she was Millian's daughter for a long time. Shortly after we got together, her father found me. He treated me as a junior, politely and kindly. White, I have watched you grow up since you were young. Let me say something straightforwardly. Inget is my only daughter. When she was young, due to our negligence, she developed autism. Look at her now, she's already 19, but she still acts like a child. Although she has improved a lot, sometimes her reactions are slower, and her perception of the outside world is weaker. Her mother and I always worry that she will be bullied or deceived. She is a good child, trying hard to adapt to society, working with you everywhere, becoming more cheerful and strong. So, Goldie's parents were aware of her part-time work outside. As parents, we may be overly protective and cherish our daughter. White, you are a responsible young man. Uncle hopes that you can take care of Goldie and patiently wait for her to grow up, okay? I understood what Uncle Million was saying and agreed to his request. In fact, we both knew that Goldie being with me wasn't necessarily because of love. Her way of discerning emotions was very different from others. I asked her what she liked about me. Goldie seriously told me, I like your colors and lines. I was especially grateful that Goldie lived in a wealthy and influential family, allowing her to peacefully live in her own little world. She was growing up, showing herself as cheerful and lively, capable of handling things on her own. But when she became quiet, she turned back into that little silly girl. One day, in the library, Goldie asked me why I liked her. I jokingly said, I was inspired by your poverty yet unyielding will. Actually, I couldn't think of a reason. She had been watching me for six years from behind, and I had secretly watched her for six years as well. Love arises without reason, and it becomes deep and unwavering. That's probably how it is.